Well, it is good to be here with you all. Thank you for coming. We are so excited about seeing you here. A lot of prayer, a lot of preparation has gone into this meeting, and uh, we're just glad that you came, and what a good crowd. Well, that's a blessing. And uh, everyone, thank you, uh, sponsors, for bringing the groups. Uh, I know it takes a lot to take a, to make a trip like this, and, and uh, we're, we're grateful that you did, and I, I hope it'll be an exciting time. We've got a lot of fun things planned for you, but... As preacher said and has been said, uh, this is focusing around preaching and the Word of God. And we'd like for you young people just to, just to sort of, uh, if you would, relax with us here a minute, open your hearts and minds to the Word of God, and allow us to be able to speak to you in the next few days. Now, we'll have a lot of fun. I get to uh, have a lot of fun with these college kids. I work as the uh, activities director out there. And um, you'd say, why in the world would they pick a guy your size to work with? Active? They're trying to get me in shape. That's what it is. And <laughs> it hasn't worked yet, but uh, so they keep me, put me in charge. But we have a lot of fun uh, out at the college with the weekly activity. And uh, we're going to have a lot of fun this afternoon and excited about that. They'll make more announcements about that uh, uh, later. But uh, we'll, we'll have a lot of fun. But don't, don't lose this moment right now and the moments where we hear the preaching of God's Word. What a message last night. What a blessing. And uh, we're excited about what's going to happen today. I would like to invite you to turn to 1 Timothy, if you would. 1 Timothy, in chapter number 1. I'll get there in just a few minutes. We'll read the text. 1 Timothy, chapter number 1. I got to thinking a little bit about uh, what to preach today, especially, in a sense, leading out the morning session. And uh, Brother Paul Jorgensen is, uh, has got a great message lined up for you. You say, what is it, brother? I have no idea. I just heard him preach before. It's good. And uh, no, we share an office over there, so sometimes we'll share the ideas and, uh, and, and beforehand. And, uh, and uh, are you going to preach that really hot one? Are you? Sorry. There we are. But anyway, all right. right now he's just, no, but anyway. And uh, it's amazing. As a matter of fact, it's so hot, I, I won't even be able to stay around. I'm going to leave. I'll not be on the platform. I know what's coming. So, I, no, the fact is, I have to do some work preparation for this afternoon, so I'll not be up here, but uh, you'll enjoy him. But. Before we get there, I want to, I want to read and, and share a thought with you, hopefully a, a message that would start us off this morning, uh, preparing our hearts and minds. Uh, let's do this. Why don't you stand with me, and uh, we'll read 1 Timothy, beginning in chapter number uh, 1, verse number 18 is where we'd like to begin. I'll read through verse number 20. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare, holding faith. And a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless now our time together. Lord, this is such an important time. Your word, Lord, is such an important thing. What a privilege it is to have it and to hear it. I pray that you'd help us to set aside the cares of this life for just a few moments now and focus. Let the Holy Spirit speak to us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have a seat. You know, just recently we, uh, matter of fact, I believe it was last Sunday that the Winter Olympics ended. And I wanted to share with you a little bit my, uh, my frustrations this morning to start out with, my disappointment. I don't know if you noticed, this is the 21st Winter Olympics that we just had. I have lived for basically half of those. I've been around for half of them. And I, I want to I state publicly, this is my first public engagement since the Winter Olympics, that I am disappointed that I did not medal. <laughs> you would think after half of 21 Winter Olympics that I would have gotten a medal, but I have not received one. And I just want to, I don't think the media is here to take my statement, but I'd let it, let it, want it to be known from you. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, I have not meddled in any of those Olympics, and I'm very frustrated by that fact. Now, you say, Brother Young, I don't recall seeing you in the Olympics. And though they do show them all times of the night, and uh, you know how disappointing. Did they even have curling this year? I mean, I, <laughs> curling is an exciting sport to watch. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not, but I mean, there's something about that little disc going down there and those guys with the broom. I mean, that's really impressive. That takes some skill. I missed that completely. You probably missed my event. You're saying, what event was that? Nordic ice cream eating? Um, I can tell you this. If they ever had that event, I have been training a long time. I can take it. 
No, I, I didn't compete in anything. So why would I be disappointed about not getting a medal? Well, I, I have to admit my disappointment is pretty small compared to others. But And I, there's always next year, uh, next time. Uh, but the fact is, no, I, 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 though I may be... Now, it w- wouldn't it be fun to get one of those medals? I wouldn't it be fun to stand on that platform, have them hang that over and hear the national anthem? And I'd love that. That'd be a moment. That'd be exciting. But I'm probably not going to experience that moment, am I? So my disappointment really is, can't be too great. I would say it pales in comparison to that athlete who trained and worked and struggled and prepared and didn't make the, the Olympic team at all. There's a lot of folks who don't even make the Olympic team. Now, they work hard. They set aside time and train and struggle, but they, they just don't, they, but they didn't even make the team. I'm going to guess, though, their disappointment because of the effort they put into it was, 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 was more than mine. But you know what? Even more than that, I would have to imagine... Now, I know some folks would be excited about just getting any kind of medal. I understand that. But I just have to imagine. And if, if I were in the place, this is where I'd be. If I got the silver medal, there would have to be a measure of disappointment in there, knowing that I just missed what I was going for. I, I can't imagine any athlete who's striving to excel in their sport, seeking to growing up and saying, I cannot wait till I grow up and participate to win the silver medal. Now, in some cases, they'd be happy to get that, but I'm just saying that's not what their goal was, was it? Their goal was to get the gold medal. And I would say the most disappointed person today, those athletes that came a hundredth of a second away from receiving gold, today probably still have a pit in their stomach saying, man, I just missed it. I just fell short. And they could probably go back in their mind and as they were competing think, man, if I just would have taken a straighter curve on that turn, if I just hit the gate better, if I had just gone a lower line on the track, if I had just one little thing, one little bobble, one little, if I just, it was right there. I had it, but I missed it. I came up short. I got to thinking about that. Some folks get so close in their life to serving God. You are right there, young people. You're right there today. Don't come up short. I love this instruction by the Apostle Paul. He's giving this charge, this challenge to his young son in the faith, Timothy. And he says there in verse number 18, that I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou mightest war a good war, warfare, holding this, well, holding, what, wait a second, he's going to tell them, I want you to fight a good fight. Boy, we've learned, we learned last night, fundamentalists, we're in a fight. We're in a fight. Devil's not, devil's not sitting on the sidelines just hoping you stumble. No, he's going to try to trip you up. He's actively against you today. And the fact is, as we look at this, he says, you're in a warfare, Timothy, but here's what you need to do. You need to hold, hold faith. You need to lay hold of faith for yourself. Grab it. They hold faith in a good conscience. Watch this. Some have put away. In other words, instead of laying hold, they let go, didn't they? In other words, what I'm trying to say here is, just like that athlete would be so frustrated, they had the gold in their grasp, and yet they fell short. How frustrating it is on the larger scale for you and I to come so close to serving God with our lives, young people, and yet letting go. Here's a couple men that did it. Paul even identified them. For whom is Hymenius and Alexander? Do you recognize the fact that this could have been the epistle to Alexander? Do you recognize the fact that Paul could have been writing to Hymenius? Now, part of me says I'm glad he didn't get a book named after him. But uh, it would be a tough one to spell. But the fact is, isn't it? these men had it. They had their fingertips on it. They had the ability to serve God just like Timothy did. But Paul is writing only to Timothy and saying, these fellows lost their grip. They came up short. I want to challenge you and I today at the beginning of this youth conference. Young people, don't come so close to being able to have God do something with your life and just let go. Don't do it. Don't come up short. As the athlete would be frustrated for not having won the gold, you and I have a prize before us, the prize of serving God with our life. Don't come up short. You say, Brother Young, in that 
passage, though, it talks about Timothy and a prophecy going before him and so forth. And I'm not like Timothy. God doesn't have... You know what? I, I got to thinking. That's, that's really not true. Because, in, in a sense, God has a prophecy to all of us to go forth and to serve God. Let, let me share that with you. I, I got to think about this. Out of John chapter 17. I won't have you turn there, but John chapter 17 is a prayer for, uh, by our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father. I love the chapter. It's an unusual heart-to-heart talk with Jesus to God. And in that, He reveals to us his attitude toward his disciples. You know what he prays for? He's praying. I mean, it's a recorded prayer. He is praying to God for his disciples. Can I sum it up for you? He prays, uh, first of all, that they would be secure in their salvation. You and I don't have to doubt our salvation. If you and I are saved today. Boy, that's settled forever in heaven. Well, that's a blessing, isn't it? I mean, that gives me the ability to go out with confidence and serve God today. Because, not because I'm trying to get myself to heaven or earn myself to heaven or home of, I gain His favor, but because I am saved today, I know I'm the object of His love and I can tap into the source of all power and serve Him today. He prayed for the security, he, that they would be secure in their salvation. He prayed for a unifying fellowship with the Father as they walked with Him. I mean, read the passage. That's what He prayed for. He wanted them to be unified with God because they were walking with Him. He also prayed for the unification of the... Fel- he wanted a unified fellowship with other Christians as they served Him together. You and I ought to be in an encouragement one another to serve God together. And He also prayed for them to be sanctified from this world, separate from this world. He prayed that for His disciples. So how does that apply to you and I today? I love verse number 20. Let me read that to you. Neither pray I for these alone. He's praying for His disciples. He's about ready to leave them. Boy, they're, they're going to be pretty discouraged here in just a minute. But boy, he spent so much time. That, those chapters in John are such a blessing to see God's heart toward you and I. And the disciples heard this prayer and heard him praying for him. But in verse number 20, it says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. Amen. Do you know by extension that is you and I? So Jesus Christ wasn't just praying that these men would have a great, successful Christian life of service to Him. He was praying for you and I. Jesus wants you and I to succeed in this life for Him. Isn't that good? I mean, not only does He want us to, He prayed that fact. I believe He's still praying today. I still still believe that Jesus Christ is praying for me to serve Him with my life. He desires it. He wants it. But you know, the fact is, that though Christ would want it and you can have it, it doesn't mean that you will. I'm mindful and of the fact that if I don't take heed of myself, and if I don't choose to serve God with my life, even though it's right there, even though it's within my grasp, though my fingers are on the prize of serving God with my life, I could come up short and miss it. I'm going to illustrate it by a couple. All of us have come up short in something in our life, haven't we? We've come up short. We've been disappointed. Uh, every month, the bill collectors, I'm coming up short. No, no. But, no, we've come up short in our lives. We've had disappointments. I like sports, and, 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 and so I'm going to use a sports illustration here, maybe a couple of them, and, and uh, for the, uh, apologize to the college kids who probably heard it eight times already, and who knows. But uh, there was a time that, uh, that I can illustrate this point, coming up short from the victory. Now, I'm not going to belabor the point. My, all my wife says is, don't, don't, you know, don't embellish the story. Just, just tell it what it is, you know. And uh, so I'll just tell you the story uh, straight out. When I was in sixth grade, we had a track meet. And that track meet was a, uh, was a competition between all the public schools. I was in public school at the time, and, and we had sort of a field day. You know what I'm talking about, those field days. I don't know some of you in public schools, maybe if you used to be, they used to have field days and all the local uh, elementary schools would get together. Sixth grade was still elementary in my day. And so we, uh, we got together to track meet. And, you know, the last thing you want to get at the track meet is a thank you for participating ribbon. <laughs> Hit me, insult me, but don't give me a thank you for participating ribbon. Thanks for trying. Ah! <laughs> the first time I ever got one, it was in kindergarten. I remember the race well. Because I was beat by two girls. Thank you for... Per- 
don't want that stupid ribbon. But in sixth grade, I was ready. Now, I was a little tall for my age at that time, about the height I am now, really grew up, shot up fast and stopped. That's rough. <laughs> but, um, but I was not the same size I was. As a matter of fact, I was rather, uh, rather, rather skinny back in the day. And um, I know it's hard to believe, but that's all right. Um, so I, I was ready for this race, at least I thought. I mean, I was, fa- I was pretty fast. I had, uh, you know, it was, a lo- it was the longest race that we were going to run. And, you know, I spo- supposedly had the advantage, you know, and all this kind of stuff. I, I, never, I didn't have any coaching. Had no idea what I was doing. The, the guy who was in charge was the only male teacher in the school, and he had no idea what he was doing. And, and so, we, you know, there was no strategy involved in the race. When, it, when they said, go, you go. Well, you know, since I wasn't prepped real well, I, I prepared myself and uh, mentally for this race. And, and I have always worn glasses. I have bad eyesight. Oh, that looks much better. Um, no, but I really do. I have bad eyesight. And so uh, if I take my glasses off, you are, you are men, as men as trees walking. You know, I mean, it just, it's, it's hard to see you. And uh, so the fact is that, uh, but I thought... Now, 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 trust me, I, we weren't in a fundamental church back at the time. And this was, you know, this was late 70s, early 80s. So I'm, I've got a nice set of hair on me at that time. I, I, you know, it was, it was attractive and I was proud of it. And, and, <clears throat> and, 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 and this wasn't a modesty issue. It should be. I think the fellas, y'all would cover up just like the girls. But, I, you know, I ran in jeans that day, not because I was... You know, it was a really modesty issue is because I had the, just a the problem, a disease and, uh, at the time. And, and, and I wanted to cover up. So I'm running in jeans. I've got this nice full hair. And it would be a modesty issue nowadays, by the way. You, you go ahead and put your long pants on, fellas. That's all right. Uh, by the way, just a reminder, that's what we do when we go over to the activity today. No shorts over there, fellas, so just keep that in mind. But uh, you say, Brother Young, if you wear shorts, I will, and it ought to be illegal. So don't, <laughs> don't think about it. It will convince you otherwise, all right? But, but the fact is, I didn't have conviction back there about that, so, but I'm still running in pants. I've got this long hair, and, I'm, you know, and you're thinking, boy, if you're going to run a race, why don't you just you know, trim it down? Definitely get rid of the hair. You know, talk about wind drag. Um, but instead of doing those things, I took my glasses off. Don't ask me what I was thinking. A sixth grade boy doesn't think very often. And so the fact is, I said, those glasses will give me wind drag. <laughs> wind drag? On your glasses? But anyway, that's what I was thinking. Now, don't, don't worry about the hair, but the wind drag on the glasses, that'd slow me down. So I take my glasses off. Well, the gun goes off, and I, uh, I, get, I get up there, and I, boy, I start, to, I just took off. I didn't know what else to do. And, and I, I'm just, boom, I'm just out. I'm, I'm way in front. I'm running, I'm running. You had to run. Basically, as you run, you run around this big curve. And as you ran around the curve, the crowd of all the kids were up there in the crowd. And they were, uh, they were, they were cheering their school on, right? And so I'm coming around that curve. And I'm way out in front. I mean, I'm just, I'm just moving. I, you know, born free, you know, kind of thing. And I'm, <laughs> wind's flowing through my hair. And, and I come around that curve and I catch the eye of my school. Yay! Excited. And I'm, oh, that man. Woo! Bum, 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 bum. And I just keep it going and I'm really, I mean, I'm getting pumped now. This is exciting. I, I've got this race. I'm excited about it. And uh, they're cheering and, uh, you know, and those are the, the little girls are saying, yay! You know, oh, there's the one I like. And uh, so I. I'm excited. I mean, I'm going to be the hero of the day. Well, I get down the, the, the straightaway there right at the end. And um, I'm, all of a sudden, the, the crowd's cheering, but I hear some of the other schools start cheering. I mean, really loud. Yay! And I'm thinking, well, that's not coming from my section. What's happening? And uh, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. And uh, you know how you do it when you don't know what to run. You start acting like at least you're running real hard. All of a sudden, I hear this pitter-patter of feet right behind me. Now, there was one boy who had some coaching and knew how to run one of these long-distance races. He just let me win myself out and get all excited about being up front, and he just had paced himself. And he didn't start out, but I'll tell you what, I heard him coming. And I heard him coming, and I knew he was coming right up behind me. My heart just went from elation to panic. I can't lose this race. I've been leading it the whole way. I can't lose that. They're cheering for me. There's that girl again. No, but anyways, I... (laughs) 
I start pouring it on, and the fact is that uh, we were getting right to the finish line, and I could tell him he was right here. He was just, just, just right in stride. Hardly heard him breathing. I'm, <gasps> <gasps> well, the finish line was coming up. I could see it as a blur across the way. <laughs> and I said in desperation, I will not lose this without strong effort. So you know what I did? Yeah, I leaped for the line. And probably if you had one of those slow motion cameras, it would just, you'd see this guy just <laughs> ready to feel that tape break across my chest and say, Yes! But instead of the tape across my chest, it was asphalt. <laughs> In my zeal to win and my foolishness, I took this off. And you know what I died for? A painted line. <laughs> I can't explain it any other way other than the heat of the moment. I thought the line that was painted across the asphalt was the tape. And I was jumping for a painted line. So I broke the line. And almost a few other things. And there that fellow went, chug, 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 right by me. I ended up, now, I, uh, the worst thing about this is, is I rolled over into the infield and wanted to die. <laughs> I wasn't saved as I was a sixth grade boy, so I'm sitting there thinking, shoelace. I'm going to tell everybody it was a shoelace. Equipment malfunction. That's what it was. I got my story down. And I got to thinking, they're not going to believe that. You're an idiot. So you know what I did? I did get back up. I did finish the race. But you know what place I got? No, fourth place. That's the scary thing of the whole story. I don't know what the other two guys did. Went off to lunch. I don't know what they did. Six guys racing. But I got fourth. You know what you get for fourth place? Thank you for participating. I was so close. You say, would you have won the race if you would not died? No, the guy was going to beat me flat out anyway. But, but it was in my grasp. That's disappointing, isn't it? You ever suffer disappointment where you come so close to something and you miss it? On a much more personal note, when I was in high school, played basketball, we had a good team. We had a very good team. For several years, had a good team. I had the privilege of starting. Now, this was one of those teams that you tried out for. We had a Christian school. It was a Christian school at the time, but it was large enough that we had tryouts, and not everybody made it. You know, I mean, you know it is. Some Christians, we, we have tryouts, but, you know, okay, breathe, breathe deeply, son. Oh, you're fine. Go ahead. Suit up. No problem. We can use you. Um... And, you know, when you have a smaller school, you had that. But it was a larger school, so we had tryouts, and not everybody made it. I had the privilege not on playing, but I started four years of basketball. I know it's hard for you to believe, but uh, they needed someone to fill up the water. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> hold down the bench on the other end. But I was able to play and play a lot. We had a good team. As a matter of fact, my junior year, we, uh, we went on and won the state tournament there in Indiana, and I was excited about that. Boy, that was, that was thrilling. Uh, I remember that day. The matter of fact, the, you know how it is. You have, you have those dream days when you're in practice, fellas. When you're sitting there thinking, two, one, and, you know, all that stuff. And you're going through that and uh, taking the realistic shots from half court over behind your head. And like, no, but the fact is we were practicing one day. And we had to do those, that free throw. And you just got to keep, keep so many free throws. And I was at the line with a guy and I was telling him, he's a good friend of mine. And I was telling him, look, it's going to come down state tournament. I'm giving the whole scenario, right? State tournament time, no time on the clock. We're down by one. You've got to nail both of them. We went. I'm giving this whole thing, and we're in practice, getting pumped up, you know, excited, and boom, he nails that first one. Ah, well, we're tied. It's a state tournament. I'm giving the whole scenario. Boom, he hits. A, he hits the second one. We win. Ah, you know. That was just practice. You know that actually happened in the state game. We were down by two with no time on the clock, and he's at the line. And all I looked at him, I said, "Remember that practice." He nailed both of them. We won. Man, that was good. That was good. But that was our junior year. We didn't lose anybody. Yeah, we lost a couple of fellows, but yeah. But we had a good team. 
We were a better team that year, my senior year. We were going out. The only game that we had lost during tournament was when we were all deathly ill. Halftime was a, you know, you know, the pukatorium. I mean, that's just what it was. It was, it was bad. We lost that game. But other than that, we, had, we, were, we were moving through the season. It was a great season. We get to the final game, though. And you ever been in one of those situations where you're going through, it's like slow motion nightmare? That's what that game was. We played an arch rival, beat them twice fairly easily in the, in the, in the thing. They had a good tournament, but, well, we were, gonna, we, were, we were going on. This was it. This was dumb. It was our senior year. Just, you know, we walk on the court and hand us a trophy. Slow motion nightmare game. Low, ugly game. Frustrating game. It's, I mean, high school game in the 30s, I think the score was like 38-37. We were the 37. As a matter of fact, the last, well, they didn't have three points in that day, and so we were down by three points with seconds left. They threw the ball down to me underneath the basket, but it was over already. I didn't even want to shoot the shot. But I shot it. It went in. Lost by one point. What a pit. So close. But I came up short. Young people right now, by the desire and design of your parents or a pastor, or a youth pastor, or a friend, or a godly teacher in your life, they are providing you an opportunity to serve God. They're bringing you right there where you can serve God with your life. You can put your fingertips on it. You say, Brother Young, no, wait a second, Brother Young, I, I do serve God. I mean, I'm going to church faithfully. I'm doing well that way. I, I work on a bus route even. I work in a science school. I, you know, I, I'm doing that, Brother Young. I've already achieved it. Now, can I remind you what Paul said very quickly in the book of Corinthians. Paul wrote this in verse number or chapter number nine, verse number twenty four of first Corinthians. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. Paul says, I want to win the prize too. There's something before me and I want to hold on to it. And he uses an illustration of athletics just as I did, and he says, We're all striving for that, but every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they that do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore, Paul says, so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Do you recognize this is the Apostle Paul? And yet he says, I am concerned about my life so much, I'm going to guard it, I'm going to pay attention to it so much because I don't want to be a castaway. The Apostle Paul... The Apostle Paul. You see, young people, we're not in a sprint. We're in a marathon. To keep with the Winter Olympics, we're not in that downhill race. We're in that long Nordic cross-country race. And you and I need to keep before us the prize of serving God. You may be serving God today, but God wants more than just you serving in a moment in time. He wants your life. And you can do it. It's before you. It's in your grasp. It starts with today. You hold on to it. I love the story in the Bible of the man whose hand claimed with the sword after the battle had a pride off. That's what we need to do with the Word of God, with the faith, as our Scripture said. Young person, not just today, but every day. Hold on to the faith. It's before you. The fact of the matter is, I've got two areas I don't want you to come short up in. I mean, I mean come short, uh, excuse me, come up short. The first area, don't come up short in salvation. Now, I'm not here to, to cause you to doubt your salvation. When I was a teenager, I had some real struggles with that. I understand. And the fact of the matter is, is uh, uh, that, that can be something to really fight with. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dare do that. But let me, let me, and let me assure you, boy, salvation, I, I wrote this down. Salvation is wonderfully simple and simply wonderful. If you are not saved today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, there's no reason to put on the show for us and pretend and wonder, well, you know what? It would be a shame for you to come so close in a youth group, in a church, to salvation, hearing it preached and taught that when you're that close that you don't lay hold on it. What would people think? I'll tell you what we'd do. We'd rejoice here. Young person, you're not saved today. You need to come down. When we have invitation after Brother George says, you need to get that right. It's not hard. You say, I don't, I'm confused. Hey, the Bible is simple. Jesus loved you. He loved you enough to die for you. He rose again for you and I to have victory over that sin, and you and I can receive Him as our personal Savior. Simple, that's too simple. That's simple enough for a child to understand, and yet the wisest of men will often reject it. 
confusing it with what the devil. Listen to the devil. Boy, you know you need to get saved today. If the Holy Spirit's working on your heart, you need to get saved today. Don't come up short. Don't come right there. You say, Brother Young, has it happened? Oh, yes, time and time again. I was, I, I was, a, I was a young teenager. My folks were saved. We were in a preaching church. We were in a, a Bible teaching church and a, and, a, and, a, and a church that was concerned about the gospel. But I had heard it for a while. But you know what I did? I, I just, well, my mom and dad are saved and people think I'm a good kid and and went through all the reasons why it would be embarrassing. And Boy, there was a day a preacher preached a sim- very simple message on salvation because the gospel is. And I got convicted by the Holy Spirit. And I said, you know, it doesn't matter what people say anymore. I've got to get saved. Don't come up short. Pilate did. What is truth, he asks, and truth stands right there before him. Agrippa did. Paul, you almost persuade me to be a Christian, but he came up short. And the one that boggles my mind, Judas Iscariot. You say, could it happen in a youth group? Judas Iscariot walked with Jesus Christ for three years and came up short. So it would not surprise me that there would be one or two today here in this crowd that has not received Christ. Don't come up short because an eternal hell is your result. And then may I challenge you, do not come short in service. The Israelites stood outside the land of Canaan, had it within their grasps, and turned around and said, we can't possess the land. And God says, all right, if you can't, there will be a generation that can, but you'll wonder. They were there, but came up short. Samson came up short. Oh, he, he even served God at times, didn't he? Holy Spirit moved on his life at times. But what a miserable death that he suffered. Because having the opportunity to serve his life and give his life for God and serve it all his life, he let go and came up short. Hymenius, Alexander in our passage, came up short. I think of Demas. We could have had had an epistle to to, to, to Demas as Paul encouraged a man that served with him and and a young man who was faithful at, at a time, at a season, but only for a season. You know why they came up short? Just like I, when I took off my glasses, everything became a blur. They got their eyes off the one that would give them clear vision. And they allowed the world to blur their vision. And because of worldly blurred vision, they came up short. We put you in places of safety. We surround you with opportunity to serve God. And to some degree, if you're doing that today, it's probably with the assistance of those that love and care for you. But there comes a day that you have to decide to serve God right here. We won't be able to make you anymore. We won't be able to have you in that net of safety anymore. And the choice will become yours. Have you decided that you're going to serve God with your life? Young person, don't come up short. As the athlete that rules the time that he just, just missed it. It's here. It's before you. Put your hand on it, young people. Grab hold of it today and don't let it go. Oh, don't come short up in your service to God. Boy, he wants to, he wants to use your life. He's got a plan for your life. He loves your life. You know, I'm encouraged by the fact that Noah did not come up short. He lived in the midst of a perverse generation, and yet he did not come up short, and he had the salvation of the ark. Abraham did not come up short. He had to leave all that was familiar to him to walk with God, and yet he grabbed hold of God, and he became the friend of God. Moses didn't come up short. By the way, he came up short when the world considered it, because within his touch was the power of Egypt. But he turned from that, and he didn't come up short with God, because he laid hold of God, and he, like no other man, walked with God such that God said, I'll commune with Moses face to face. And by the way, Paul, the one who watched his life and was concerned about being a castaway, he didn't come up short. Because Paul said, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course, and I have kept the faith. Henceforth, by the way, is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He got the goal inside, and he laid hold of that opportunity to serve God. And he did it. 
So where do you start, young person? Right here, right now. Can I challenge you? Don't come up short in this conference. Preaching and preaching and activity and uh, that, that. Boy, it's busy. And you know what you can do? You can let your mind wander and you can miss what you have right before you. If you're not careful, start today and say, I'm going to lay hold on this. I'll lay hold on that. And I'm going to grasp everything they say. And I'm going to listen to my youth leader and my director here. And I'm going, to, I'm, going to, I'm going to get a hold of what God wants for me out of this conference. I'm going to be yielded to that. Let me challenge you. Don't come up short right now. It's an everyday thing, isn't it? It's day after day. But if you'll lay hold on that and just lay hold on God and say, I'm not letting you go, Lord. Then at the end of your life, you'll not... You say, well, what if someone runs a better race? You know, this race is not against you and you and you and you. But you and I can all get the gold this time. The race is really only against me, isn't it? Will I run it to the end or will I come up short? Don't come up short, young people. God bless you.